Hey folks, Alamandic, Mandic really here, and I have 3D printers that I need to work on. Mostly smaller projects that I haven't been able to make the time for between all the other bigger projects I've been filming. So that's what this is going to be, a little workshop vlog where we get to all those smaller tasks I just haven't had time for, see if we can't get a couple of 3D printers running better or just running at all. So let's get to it. First things first, after the last couple of big project videos, the studio is a disaster. Sorting scrap filament, moving a supercharger, the usual things you have to do when you're cleaning up a 3D printing studio. In the process of this, I found a box. My LTT screwdriver that showed up last week. Let's get this thing unboxed so we can use it while we're working. LTTstore.com. Sad reality is I actually bought this. So they basically just got a free ad out of me because I enjoy making videos and wanted to have fun unboxing this thing. With this in hand, let's work on the first project. My Prusa Mark III S Plus. I'm about to utter a fairly divisive sentence. I'm not a fan of my Prusa Mark III. I've just never really connected with this machine. As such, I'm gonna send it out to pasture. However, a few months ago, I put a E3D Revo 6 in it. I do like that, and it did make me like this machine better. But since I put a E3D Revo CR into my main Ender 3, I've really not been using this machine. So it's time to say goodbye to the Prusa, not the Revo 6. I'm keeping that. I'm putting the stock V6 back in. And now for my absolute least favorite thing about this machine, we have to go into the overstuffed electrical box. And there's the rat's nest. Let's get this thing out of here. And now we just have to reverse the steps. I'm forcing myself to use the LTT screwdriver for this, just to like see how I like it for working on printers. I would usually be using my little electric screwdriver for this, and I'm sure I'll end up going back to that, but initial impressions, the quality of this thing, it's the best quality merch I've ever seen, that's for sure. Before I go tidying up the wiring, another thing I gotta do is replace the bed thermistor in this thing, so I'm gonna have to get in the electrical box for that anyway. Might as well just get right to that while we're here. While I'm working on this thing, I feel like I should probably just answer the question, and I'm sure some folks are gonna ask, why don't you like that machine? So many people love those things. I have a couple of reasons. Uh, one, out of the box, mine was broken. That probably put a sour taste in my mouth right away. The glass bed thermistor that I'm replacing again right now um, was smashed and broken out of the box. And I can guarantee you it wasn't for me mishandling it, smashing it, it came out of the box smashed. I mean, there is that fact. People give Creality crap for running glass bead thermistors on their hot ends, which, yeah, they're delicate, don't get me wrong, but the thermistor on the underside of this bed is literally just taped onto it, and it is also just a glass bead thermistor. This one seems to be spotty. It, when moved to like a certain bed position, seems like maybe it has a short in the wiring or something. It just starts reading improperly and it's ruined a handful of prints, so it's gotta go. I personally dislike the Z offset adjustment in the Prusa firmware, so the live Z adjust. I've just never been a fan of it, and I think that I'm not alone in that, since one of the things they call out about the Prusa XL is that you're not gonna have to do Live Z Adjust anymore. Almost like, I wish I didn't have to do it now. I hate that. Because of the way this is designed with the magnets in the bottom of it, when you go to put these spacers on to put the bed back on, sometimes the spacer sucks over to the magnet. This electronics box should absolutely be bigger than this. The only reason I see that it is so small is so they can reduce their print time and material costs for production. There's a few other things, but at the end of the day, it's a solid machine, does a great job for a lot of folks. They love these things, and I can see why. It's just not for me. And just like that, this thing is back to stock. 
I needed to do a PID auto tune on the hot end. Thankfully, they do have that in the menu system. Excellent there. And then I can put this thing up for sale. Yeah. I'm gonna work on the budget V0 yet, but I think next is just gonna be a quickie where we swap out the bed on this Ender 3. This is my original Ender 3 that I have put through a lot at this point. One of the only things that's still stuck on it is the bed on there. So we're gonna go ahead and change that by putting on a precise printer parts cast aluminum MIC6 bed. Funny enough, the bed on this is actually pretty flat and really not bad. I need it for another project you folks will see real soon. So we're gonna make this changeover. As noted, this bed is 6.35 millimeter, AKA quarter inch thick cast aluminum. So it should handle thermal expansion and contraction better and be a flatter, more stable base for this machine, but definitely heavier. Something to note about the precise printer parts beds that I personally like and some folks disagree with is that it has a groove in the top and a recess for a thermistor to be inserted on the top side of the bed, right below the bed magnet or bed surface. I'm gonna start off by, well, removing the bed sheet and then getting into the electronics box and undoing the wiring to start. Now I need to disconnect the bed thermistor and loosen up the terminal block for the bed heater circuit. Now I can just loosen up all the adjuster wheels on the bed so I can remove it. One 220 watt bed heater in bed ready for a different project. For the bed heater, we're gonna use this nothing special 300 watt 24 volt unit on here. And hopefully it's not gonna to be too much for the power supply as I'm still running the stock one. Quick wipe down with alcohol for the bed. And let's get this thing stuck. I also have this insulation pad for an Ender 3 bed that I've never used. And I might as well give it a try on this thing. I think it's probably kind of garbage, but we shall see. Hopefully I don't end up regretting putting this on here. I probably will. Something I do when installing bed magnets is I mark the original hole position for the pass-through bolts for the bed leveling and bed install. Then I use one of these hole punchers, a sacrificial board, and a hammer to punch a couple of holes into the magnet so I can still access the hardware through it later. I'm gonna put a spot of thermal paste in where the thermistor for the bed is gonna go. I've gotta install that so I can install the magnet over top of it. And now it's time to put the bed back on the machine. Spin the thumb wheels back on so the bed is secured to the carriage and I can go to the wiring. I'm gonna end up designing a strain relief that'll mount to this bed at some point here. For the moment, I'm just gonna sleeve the cable, put some heat shrink on as a bit of a strain relief and go with that for a very limited period of time. I say as if those aren't famous last words. Crimp some ferrules onto the end of the bed heater wires, insert them, and then plug in the NTC100K on the top side of the bed to the main board, cause that's the thermistor I'm gonna use. I just need to do a PID auto tune and then reset the Z limit switch because of the thickness of this new bed and the new bed springs. I'm absolutely gonna have to make some adjustments in that regard, but that can wait for when I'm actually ready to print with this thing. The last project for today is the budget Voron V0. We're gonna replace the mini afterburner extruder assembly with a mini after Sherpa. First things first to get the access that I need in here, taking off the top hat's gonna make a lot of sense, but unfortunately, the LTT screwdriver is not going to fit in here to get to these screws. So back to my old trusty electric screwdriver, it is. The Mini After Sherpa design uses the Annex Engineering Mini Sherpa extruder assembly, which uses Bontech BMG gears, same as the Mini Afterburner, but it's a more skeletonized design that I actually really like both the looks of it and the actual functionality. I personally just find that the mini afterburner is too enclosed. I can't see what's going on inside of there to diagnose problems. And also it doesn't have a completely straight filament path. There's at least one little jog in it in there. Whereas this mini after Sherpa is a straight through design with a more straight and shorter filament path. I'm gonna start off by freeing up the wiring here and then removing the extruder motor assembly. I'm going to reuse the existing extruder motor from the mini afterburner just because I don't feel like re-sleeving the LDO motor that I have into this harness. I also have a home for this LDO motor on my project Reanimator build that we'll get to in the next workshop vlog, probably. 
Next up, we're gonna remove the mini afterburner shroud front here. Now I've got to remove the fans and the hot end from the mini afterburner shroud so they can be transferred to the new one. I've discovered a failure in my mini afterburner with the printed parts that came with this budget Boron B Zero kit. Some folks have said that they've seen layer adhesion issues and print issues with this silver filament. I hadn't seen any in my kit to this point, but here is the first indication of a problem. Hot ends free, now I just need to get these fans out of here, which is gonna be difficult because they went in real tight. I might be best off just destroying this to get them out of here. Oh yeah, that's a lot easier. Now I've got the fans out of the old housing. I got to put those into the new housing first here, and then I can put the hot end in and then mount the extruder on top of that after I mount it to the X carriage. Now I've just got to mount the new shroud assembly to the X carriage bracket using the original screws. Had to replace the 30 millimeter with a 35 millimeter for this one, but that ought to get us where we need to be. Now I just need to measure for a piece of PTFE tube. In this case, I'm gonna use a piece of Capricorn tube. In a situation like this, the way that I do it is I just stick it down into the hot end, mark the top flush with the extruder mount face. Then for the extruder body portion, I do the exact same thing. I measure by sticking it in there, mark it, drop it. Then I measure those two lengths there and add them together. And that tells me how long the piece of tubing I need between the extruder and the hot end is. In this particular instance, I'm at 7.5 into the extruder body, 32.25 into the hot end. So if I add those two together, I'm joking, 39.75 for that. So honestly, I'll probably go like 38, 38.5 maybe. I like to make it just a hair long. So when I bolt down the extruder, it actually kind of squishes and, and puts tension on this tube to make sure it's really seated in there. I'll use a countersink bit on my drill to put a little chamfer at the inlet of the Bowden tube and use a razor blade to clean up any little bits that hang on just to give a smooth transition for the filament into the tube. Run a 1.5 millimeter hex wrench or a piece of filament through to be sure that it's good and clear. And now I have my little Bowden tube piece, which means I'm now ready to mount my extruder onto here. Now I just need to swap the LDO motor off of here, put the one that came with this kit back on, cable manage the wires. Now I've just got to put the top hat back on here and do a rotation distance tune on this setup. And then I have an extruder, but I personally like a bit better. Before we wrap this up, let's get my thoughts about the LTT screwdriver in here. I honestly expected this thing to be overhyped. But what I got is I think the nicest ratcheting screwdriver I've ever used. The ratcheting mechanism is beautiful, sounds so pleasing, it's comfortable grip. The rear cap spins a 360 degrees, so as I'm ratcheting, I can just leave that in the palm of my hand like a precision screwdriver and just keep on pushing with it. The magnet holds really nicely. I like the bit storage. I didn't think I would, but I've grown to like it already, but I need a full metric bit set for working on printers. And that's the other thing is, this is a little bit big for working on printers or I kind of think even computers some of the time. I will absolutely continue to use it and leave it on my workbench, but I'm gonna be using my electric screwdriver most of the time. And as far as value for the price, I kind of viewed this as merch. Instead of buying a t-shirt or a hat that I might wear sometimes, I got a functional tool and supported a creator's company that I enjoy. So from that perspective, I think it was worth it. All right, folks, I could wander around the studio and pick up a dozen more projects to fit into a video like this, but I think that's where we're gonna wrap it up for today. I do have some big videos coming as far as full printer builds, some new products to test out, and a full studio revamp is coming in the very near future as well. I hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please drop it a like. It really helps out. Let me know in the comments. What do you think about a video like this where I work on smaller stuff that doesn't necessarily warrant its own full dedicated video? Let me know in the comments down below. Get to subscribe to keep up to date with all the content and to ensure your 3D prints don't fail. It's not a guarantee, but it can't hurt.